Hi Dacians friends, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm responding to comments and questions, continuing conversations. I know I haven't posted too many videos since doing one of these videos, but I have gotten a lot of comments and questions because it's been a long time, about three weeks, maybe a little bit longer since I've done one of these. And I figure since I'm getting back into doing content, it would be great to sit down, answer some comments, chat with you guys a little bit, and then we can get into our regularly scheduled fragrance programming. So let's get into the video. First things first, I always like to say this during these videos, is that I am not a fragrance expert or a trained authority. I am a fragrance consumer and a collector. That doesn't mean that my opinion and thoughts on scent are not valid, but when it comes down to fragrance formulas and understanding how to build a formula or the industry, education and experience mean a lot. And I don't have that, except for what I have taught myself through research, um, going online and just learning through other people and blah, blah, blah but also through just being a consumer. Some people take the opinions of people who have gone to school or have worked in the industry at a higher value, and some people prefer an untrained uh, consumer review or opinion. You can value whatever you want. I'm always just letting you know where I'm coming from. Uh, when I talk about formulas and how notes smell and things like that, I'm not coming to you as somebody who is a perfumer or trained or anything like that. But again, that does not mean that I, my opinions and thoughts are not valid, but that also means that people who are educated or trained, their, their opinions are valid too. You guys decide whatever is important. But as we talk about fragrance, I always like to let you know. Uh, the other thing is my hands are still, oh gosh, this looks horrible. Um, tie-dye adventure. I might wear the clothes uh, this week, so you might see some of my tie-dye stuff. I was so bored, <laughs> so I had a bunch of white shirts, and I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna pretend I'm in high school again, because I used to do that, like high school, middle school, tie-dye my clothes, bleach my clothes, I had so much fun doing that. So I, I yeah, my, my hands, they're not as bad as they were in the other video, but yeah, they're still gonna be kind of weird, so please excuse, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Let's get into the video. So this first comment comes from my green tea fragrance video and this comes from banana and their comment is you need to dry try J scents roasted green tea gorgeous scent. Well, guess what? Uh, before you had posted that comment, which is three days ago a week before that I had actually ordered that fragrance that had been on my must buy list That's one of my must buy lists J scent and when I get this fragrance, I will talk about it it's the first fragrance I purchased from them, but this is a fragrance line I am eager to explore. I purchased it blind, but when I talk about it, I'll tell you guys why I'm interested in it. Uh, I am excited for this fragrance and this line of scents. So they have like a Ramune scent, they have a cherry blossom scent, they have a variety of different fragrances. So the roasted green tea believe it's hojicha. I, I have such a hard time. It's been literally over 20 years since I took Japanese, so my pronunciation is abysmal. But when I look to green tea fragrances, I love when there is distinctive tea notes. I talked about it more in black tea, but with green tea, I love seeing distinctive green tea. And you see it more when there's like a matcha note or a gyokuro note. Um, or when they utilize uh, oak moss to kind of mimic the tannic acid in tea. So it smells less like a green tea scent, but smells like a tea fragrance. So the idea that there was a roasted green tea fragrance out there, specifically a specific roasted green tea, I was super excited. So yes, I definitely ordered that. That was supposed to be part of my uh, birthday haul as well. So I talked about how I didn't buy all of the fragrances that I wanted to buy for my in my birthday month because of everything that was happening that was one of the fragrances that I had put off even though it was very inexpensive um, it is still a pricey fragrance I think it's like $80 but that's not incredibly expensive for the cost of fragrances um, considering some of the fragrances that I purchased were like a thousand dollars like four hundred dollars it was still 
uh, considered to be like an expensive designer fragrance price point but I definitely purchased it like immediately the second I was like it like ready to buy something I I added that to my cart I am so excited to try this scent and if this scent impresses me I will probably end up by the end of the year just letting you guys know uh, ordering a lot more fragrances from this house because this is a house that I've been very interested to discover and explore so yeah definitely that's on its way to me hopefully it'll be delivered today or tomorrow actually I was hoping it would be delivered before I filmed this video because I wanted to be like well look what I got but no not here this yet this is actually kind of like a fun comment I think this comment was mentioned in fun and I, I'm taking it as fun this was in my last video uh, where I was answering comments and questions and the comment is you really don't know how old you are that's weird so I don't have any issue with age I'm one of those people where I'm actually really excited about the not the aging process but I've always been excited about every stage of life like I'm gonna mourn my youth and I do mourn like you know my early 20s and my like very early 30s but I'm also enjoying the stage of life I am now and I'm going to enjoy the stages of life that I get into. I think that's the best way to be because there's no changing it. It's not like you cannot get older. But I also understand that people have very real feelings about age and I'm not going to sit here and say that anything's wrong with having any real feelings with age. My thoughts are I'm just going to enjoy whatever stage of life that I'm in. I'm also the type of person that I'm an adult and I get to decide what that means in regards to how I dress, how I act, you know, I'm definitely not mature in regards to anything other than, you know, my skin. But um, when it comes down to knowing my actual number of age, I, I don't pay attention to it, mostly because it's not relevant. And I think that once I hit like, I think 32 or 33, I just kind of I don't really even celebrate my birthday that sounds weird but it's like my birthday month I'm like oh it's an excuse to kind of celebrate my mom you know when my mom and my my dad was alive it was their anniversary it was my husband's birthday my sister's birthday one of my close friends we share the same birthday we're birthday twins we have like a race to see who can wish each other happy birthday first um, my uh, brother-in-law's birthday there's so many things happening in August for me it's more of a celebration month that I kind of just forget about the number that I'm turning you know That's a great comment I get this all the time a lot of times this comment itself is very positive and more of a question but sometimes people will throw criticism and this is very valid criticism so whenever people throw this criticism at me I, I never think it's rude or inappropriate it's a very valid criticism to have especially for a very large fragrance collection this comes from Corbin Dallas their comment is I'm so hesitant to build a big collection after finding out fragrances had a shelf life I smell some after only a few years and they seem quite off don't you worry about this so yes and no now I've talked about it before this room that I'm in is my office when I did my like my more recent fragrance tour I talked about like my lighting and my work habits when I am not in this room working all the lights are off and this is a very cold room so this room is the safest place for these fragrances and when I am working in here unless I am filming or photographing products all of the lights are off in here because when I work on my computer I have a little area that's lit and then everything else is nice and dark. So fragrances do and do not have a quote unquote shelf life. I would say they don't have an expiration date. I would say fragrances have a best buy date, but it has more to do with maintaining uh, or order efficiency. No, that's the word. Being like little soldiers. There we go. I, I can't say words. I am dealing with crazy brain fog today. Gotta love fibromyalgia and also traumatic brain injuries from car accidents. But I'm doing my cognitive rehab as best, best as I can. But when it comes down to best buy dates, there is a reason why specifically designer fragrance houses will have shelf lives because they want their fragrances to smell identical, like identical 
uh, batch to batch to batch unless they reformulate. So if the color of the fragrance will slightly turn, so say you have a clear fragrance. Hold on, let me grab to use this one as an example because it's the easiest one. Again, please excuse my dyed fingers. So this is Chanel number no. five Lu. Now you see how the juice, the, the fluid inside is clear, but it has a little tint of yellow, little tint of yellow. This bottle is probably like two years old, two years old. I do wear this one a lot. I do have a travel atomizer of this, which is where I usually wear this. This fragrance, the way that this fragrance smells, smells identical to a brand new bottle. If I were to go to say Ulta or Macy's or Dillard's or any place that sells a bottle of this scent. However, if I were to go to a bottle, uh, to go to a store like say Macy's or Ulta or Dillard's and buy a bottle of this, the, f the, the fluid inside would be crystal clear, like water, it wouldn't be slightly yellow. So the shelf life of some of these fragrances is for the integrity of just the experience. And in some cases with fragrances like this, it could be just aesthetics, coloration. You know, this smells identical. Now, this is where when I gave you guys that disclaimer in the beginning that I am not educated in regards to going to perfumery, perfumery school. Um, so I don't have any understanding, any real understanding of the science of the chemistry of fragrance formulas. Uh, I will give you my basic knowledge on fragrances that I have, a little bit of research that I've done just myself and also my experience having some older bottles of perfume and things like that. There is a huge market for vintage fragrances and older formulations. People will go out and they will try to find bottles of formulations that are 20 or 30 years old because uh, reformulation is killing some beautiful, beautiful formulas and some fragrances are whispers are of what older reformulations used to be. So people will look for 20 to 30 to 40 year old older bottles. And if you think about that, that might sound like a super old bottle, but like if I think about 20 years ago, like I was in high school, that's not that long ago. I still have some bottles in my collection from when I was in high school and they still smell perfectly fine. The top notes might be gone and the formula might be a little bit more concentrated, but the general experience is, I would say, like 80% of what I would expect it to be. Like, is it a floral fragrance? It smells kind of the same. When it comes down to the fragrance being not wearable, not safe, that is what I think people think about with expiration dates. So I've really only had to get rid of a few bottles, and in an older video, I forgot that I had gotten rid of a bunch of uh, cheaper fragrances by cheaper I mean like you can get these for like 10 20 bucks the fragrances smelled very like heavy on the alcohol and on other people they smelled fine on me they didn't smell fine and I just kind of decluttered them uh, and they were like probably like three or four years old and I just didn't wear them and they were kind of leaking so they weren't safe to like sell or swap so I just kind of tossed them safely properly <laughs> properly disposed of them but when it came down to getting rid of fragrances that in my opinion were like turned bad there were two and one was a bottle of fragrance I bought when I was a freshman in high school and that was in 1999 and that was an old bottle of sugar cookie from Demeter and the other one was my beloved bottle of honey gentle water from the Asatan and that quite literally looked like there was like chunks of like soap or shampoo, like just floating. It had huge floaters. It just looked like egg whites were floating in it. It was, it still smelled fine, but it just, there was something about the formula that just turned. And I had also gotten that one, like when I was in high school. So, or maybe a little bit after high school, maybe right out of high school, like maybe 2000. I'm not quite sure when that fragrance was released, but like I've had that one for a very long time and I got rid of it when I had my channel. I was actually even talking about it. So. The thing is, is that there are some formulas where a fragrance will kind of turn, 
where yes, you might decide to get rid of it because it kind of seems unsafe, but when it comes down to uh, the, the shelf life of scents, you're talking about, will that fragrance smell exactly the same as when you purchased it? And a fragrance will start to, the formula might start to degrade because of evaporation, uh, just maybe because of the chemicals. Again, the formula, how everything's mixed and blended. Please remember I'm talking as somebody who has absolutely no education or training, so I could be completely wrong. But that doesn't mean that the fragrance is unwearable. And in some cases, sometimes people prefer a more mature fragrance. Sometimes people prefer the fragrances to sit and stew and just be more, you know, be that way. So um, that is something very much to consider that some people like fragrances to be on the more vintage side or on the older side, they prefer older bottles. So that doesn't mean that fragrances go bad. Now there is a big issue that I would say isn't so much to do with fragrances expiring, although you might not like the way a fragrance develops or matures over the course of time, but there is a very real issue with evaporation. So the biggest issue would be is if you buy a bottle of perfume over the course of you know years, the fragrance is not so much like it'll evaporate and your formula changes, it evaporates and it's completely gone. It's disappeared, your fragrance is gone, it's gone to the wind. So I would say that would be my bigger concern with my collection is evaporation over my fragrances going bad because of like a shelf life expiration issue is an evaporation issue. So there are a few brands that are kind of more luxury niche where their bottles are kind of more screw on. And I do check them from time to time and screw them. And I've even considered um, weirdly like vacuum sealing some of these bags because some of these bottles are very expensive and only getting them out of the vacuum sealed bags when I'm ready to wear them. I've considered that for some of these, although I don't know if that's the proper way to do it. But uh, when it comes down to shelf life and fragrances, some of the bottles in my collection that maybe are 10, 15 years old, even though those would be considered bad and expired, they smell perfectly fine, maybe a little bit stronger, maybe the top notes are a little bit more dissipated. So the first you know, hour of experience of the fragrance is different. The overall experience of the scent, in my opinion, is relatively uh, very similar, so I still get an enjoyable experience with the beautiful perfume that I uh, enjoy wearing. But everybody has their own thoughts and opinions on that. Uh, the best thing to do is to be mindful in regards to your collection. Uh, like I said, people look at my collection and they say that's excessive and I say that's correct. <laughs> I think anybody has more than maybe like six or seven bottles has an excessive collection. I have over a thousand. So um, people having very valid criticism and critique about any part of my collection, I think is, va is valid, <laughs> is that is valid. I, I don't take any personal um, hurt from people saying anything about this. I, I get it. But when it comes down to expiration date, I am very mindful about how I keep this room, but I'm also like not as worried about shelf life. I'm more worried again about evaporation, like the fragrance is just disappearing. And I have noticed there have been a few bottles that I've had that issue with, but I have addressed it and I'm taking action. <laughs> but other than that, um, Keeping in a cool, dark place will prolong your fragrance. You also want it to be dry, a cool, dry, uh, dark place. Keeping them in their boxes is ideal. I can't keep this many fragrances in their boxes. It doesn't make any sense. I would have absolutely no room. But if you have a like smaller, larger collection, so maybe between like 15 to 50 bottles, I would say keeping them in their boxes would be a great way to prolong the longevity of your actual collection. Thank you. This is from Katie Commons. This is on my August haul. Their comment is, I'm very new to your channel and I just want to say I care about you and your health. Thank you. I'm wishing nothing but health and happiness and good luck on your strength training journey. Love from Ireland. Thank you so much. So uh, most of, oh, hi, that was me kicking my, uh, my microphone thing. Hi. 
So if most of you guys don't know, I struggle with uh, chronic illnesses, fibromyalgia, I'll just list them all for you, why not? Fibromyalgia, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome specifically, hypermobile, very benign version of it. I can't do all the bendy things with my thumbs and my skin, but my, my pelvis and my, my joints are super bubble gum in regards to like, I can hurt myself real easy. I also have endometriosis, I have IBS, IBS dealing with something specifically like bile acid malabsorption, and uh, I had a car accident two years ago, which I talk about all the time, like a parrot, and I had a, a, tr a brain injury that wasn't a concussion, it was worse than a concussion, which if you wonder why I have a hard time forming words, um, that, yeah, on top of the brain fog from fibromyalgia. So it's safe to say that, yeah, life's fun, but um, being a spoonie and dealing with all these fun little things, uh, for the longest time, I couldn't be healthy. Physically, I couldn't be healthy. I had gained, uh, let's see, back in 2010, I was going to try and get my certification to be a scuba diver because John was a scuba diver. We were going to try and do, uh, he does like advanced open water and things like that. And I was going to do it. We were going to do scuba diving all the time. And so I was swimming every day, snorkeling every day, eating very healthy. I, uh, it's the easier instead of saying weight, just to say my size in the U.S. I went from like a size eight, six, eight. In three months, I gained 90 pounds without eating. This is with exercising every single day and eating and watching my macros and micros. I gained 90 pounds every single day. I do not know why. No idea why. Talk to so many doctors, still don't know why. Um, and yeah, went from like a size eight, six, eight to size like 22. And over the course of until recently, no idea what happened. Um, so yeah, that was scary. And I had no problem with my size looks wise. It was health wise. So, you know, like beauty comes in every size. Some of the most beautiful people I've seen have been big, beautiful, luscious women. Like I look at them and I'm like, I, I wish I looked as gorgeous as you are. And they are, you know, like larger than sizes 22. And they're same thing with people who are smaller. Beauty comes in every size as long as you're healthy and confident and happy. That's the most important thing. I, however, was not healthy because gaining that much weight, just like if you lost that much weight that quickly, not healthy. So um, over the course, I'd say of the last, let's say 12 months, uh, 12 months, I found a doctor who was very proactive, <laughs> very proactive, and who took and understood that I had these chronic illnesses and said the weight loss wasn't a cause of the chronic illnesses, but was a symptom. Because all the other doctors, and I think anybody, anybody, doesn't matter if you have chronic illnesses, anybody who is slightly overweight or a lot overweight, you go to a doctor and you complain about an illness and they'll just say lose weight and they don't take any other symptoms seriously. And sometimes weight can be the cause or it can be the symptom. And for me specifically, it was a symptom. Also, real quick, if you're wondering why I'm wearing a shirt on this side and on this side, I've talked about it before, my fibromyalgia. Um, I'm just making sure my microphone isn't being all thing. Uh, fibromyalgia is super funny. It really flares up in me right here in this area. If I wear clothes right here, I, I want to, I just want to like crawl into, into a pit and just start screaming. I hate wearing clothes on the shoulder. Yeah. Um, but my doctor, my OBGYN, she's like, she looked at like my labs and everything like that, which was normal, but on the lower side. And she's like, she started addressing the weight gain as a symptom and not the cause. And the second we started doing that, everything changed. And this is what gets me so angry sometimes at very competent doctors, but who just look at somebody and don't listen. And I understand doctors can be very overworked, but I have been dealing with doctors for over a decade about this. And I've been trying to tell them I've had these same issues and these same illnesses before the weight. Uh, this weight happened in three months. This is this, I, I had my bubblegum joints. I had my IBS, I had all this before. And they're like, oh, just, just walk it off, just try yoga. It's like, <laughs> please listen to me. And the second a doctor listened to me, I was able to start getting better. So 
Uh, so thank you for that. So with that, I was able to get to a healthy weight back to where I was before. Hooray. Yeah. Hooray. So I'm back to, I'm not at a healthy weight yet because I have to start building muscle. So what I'm doing now is it's kind of like a body recomposition. I'm not bulking. I'm not eating a lot of food, not eating a lot of food, just trying to get as much protein in me as possible because for my Ehlers Danlos specifically, I deal with a lot, and I mean a lot, of joint issues. I have baseline muscular skeletal pain constantly, constantly. Um, it's like my baseline's like four or five. Yeah, it's great. Um, but so my joints don't roll, my pelvis doesn't hurt. I need to really focus on building muscle and strength in my, obviously my posterior chain, but specifically like my, my legs and, and my booty. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing. And I really have to quote unquote feed the muscle. So I'm trying to get as much protein in me as possible. And it's so hard, but I found a smoothie recipe that I like, which is a mango lassi protein smoothie, which is what I've been like chugging all the time while still trying to maintain proper calories, uh, proper, like I'm watching my micros and my macros, making sure I'm eating balanced. Like I'm not just eating nothing but like fruit. I'm having proper, you know, fiber and, you know, lean meats. I'm trying to be, any, anyway, I'm getting there. But what I'm excited for is I'm able to lift weights without hurting my joints. So if people have Ehlers-Danlos to a real degree than what I have, I have a very benign version, very, very benign version. Uh, you can dislocate your, your joints just by opening a jar of mayonnaise. You can step wrong and dislocate your joints. Some people have to rely on mobility aids, which I think... I think it stinks that they have to rely on mobility aids, but I'm very bl happy that mobility aids are available for people because I know that it's been harder in the past for people with specifically this disease to be taken seriously in regards to like mobility aids because a lot of times you don't might not need that wheelchair every single day. You might not need your cane every single day. You might not need your brace every single day. So there might be some days where you don't need your cane. You might, and might be some days where you can walk and you don't need your wheelchair and there might be some days where you're going to be in uh, relying on your mobility aids every single day so um, having the ability and people actually taking invisible disabilities seriously um, especially on people who rely on mobility aids from almost like an hour to hour basis like how do I feel what do I need uh, me particularly I don't need them I'm very lucky and I'm very blessed and for me to be able to function without hurting myself um, is, is building muscle. And the reason why I'm kind of talking about this, because this is something I'm very passionate about. I don't talk about this too much because this is a fragrance channel, but this is something that I've really been focusing on the past like, like year is like I... I struggle with this so much. Fibromyalgia is so painful and it's so hard to describe how it is because it's, it's like some people don't even believe it's a real disease, but with Ehlers-Danlos, with me specifically, oh, as I kick things, I deal with such a benign version of this. I am so blessed, but I also feel like I have imposter syndrome. So I don't like to talk about it because I don't want people to feel like this is the face of this disease because I know that people who have this disease truly struggle with this. This is a real struggle and I struggle with it, but it is not like a real struggle for the majority of people who have this disease. I'm very blessed to have a very, 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 very low level of this. But uh, for me, strength training was out of the question until I was able to address the weight because the weight was putting so much stress on my joints, on my muscles, on my skeleton. 
it made me fatigued it made me stressed it made my inflammation worse obviously with the fibromyalgia it just made everything i there was no way i would try to lift up like a hand weight and like i would be in pain for for days like it just a little like four pound weight I would walk and I would like roll my pelvis and I would be crying in bed. I wouldn't dislocate my pelvis, I wouldn't be dislocating, but like my joints were so loose that I would be injuring myself just from trying to be active. Uh, just because the weight was putting so much stress and pressure on me, it was, there was no way I could do anything. I could do very low impact things. So once I was able with my doctor through doctor supervision to address the weight I was able to then start working out and lifting, which is for me individually, not my diseases. Not saying anybody who has my diseases, go out and do this because you, you, everyone knows their body and everyone's different. But because I'm so blessed to have to deal with the lower, lower baseline versions of this, um, I was able to start handling my symptoms through um, exercise and I'm lucky and privileged to be able to do that as somebody who has this disease so I've really focused on building muscle in my legs <laughs> so it's weird because even when I was a volleyball player I didn't have defined quads I'm getting defined quads now which is kind of cool I'm getting to find everything down here, which is kind of neat. My upper body is still garbage. I'm still working on that. Um, I have a, the only problem I have right now that I'm working on is my grip. It's like, oh, like this with my hand. It looks like something out of like a horror movie from like the 80s. Uh, my grip strength in this hand is horrible. So I want to start lifting heavier. I want to start doing more rack squats, some more very heavy um, compound lifts. I cannot do it because of my grip strength in this hand. So strength wise, I can do it, but this, this hand, this hand can do it. This hand cannot. So right now I'm just going to be focusing on making that grip strength in this hand stronger and also focusing on just kind of moving forward. So it's exciting. I will never be able to obviously be like a power lifter, pro lifter. I do not have the joints for that. I, I do not have, I don't have the joints for that. I do not have the genetic code for that. And what I mean by that is, is like, I can hurt myself because of my bubble gum joints if I try to push myself too hard or too, too much. So I'm being very mindful about my realistic expectations of how far and how heavy I can lift, but I am excited to push myself forward because I have found that through all the exercise I've done aside from swimming, because I can't run, no, no, that, no, mm -mm, not a runner, no way, my joints cannot handle stuff like that. I can't even do like jump lunges or like jumping squats, anything like that, mm -mm, nope, 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 nope. It's real hard for me to do certain types of cardio because a lot of that's very high impact. I'm working on it. I'm trying to find the right routine, the right thing to do good. But when it comes to strength and lifting and doing specific, obviously I can do different types of cardio, but I'm very mindful about what I can and can't do because of my joints. Everything hurts. It hurts and it hurts for a very long time afterwards. So I found that lifting has been fantastic for me as a way to get healthier and stronger and help my symptoms, help me manage my symptoms. My symptoms are still here. Chronic is chronic, they're not going away. But in order for me to manage my baseline pain, um, this has been fantastic. So I've really been really happy about moving forward with this. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. And I know I talked way too, way too long about it, but anyway, there we go. Anyway, since I talked way too long about that, we'll end it here. But I will say for the longest time, for the past few months, I've thought about talking about that, actually. Talking about more in depth what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. Um, not because I think you guys care. I mean, I'm not saying that you guys don't care. I'm obviously 
I'm, I'm still very doughy. Um, I'm not like a personal trainer. I don't have any education or anything like that. But I've always found it to be kind of cool to hear other people's stories. And also, you know, I thought maybe people might want to hear a real, a real story from a real human being, <laughs> not some like fitness guru, you know, maybe just some random potato who looks like more like a fingerling potato now, not like a russet potato. Anyway, um, if that's something you guys be interested in, me going more into that, I'd be more than happy to, but it would obviously not be fragrance related. But anyway, I'm ending the video here. Tomorrow we will have a fragrance review. Get excited, actual fragrance content. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you.